Um, once again, very good afternoon to everybody. And uh, also, sorry once for the delayed start, but uh, the reasons you know. Um, I'm really grateful that each and every one of you has taken the time to be here uh, and would like to welcome you to this round table on reimagining radio broadcasting. I'm Amjad Khan, I'm from the Asia Center, and today we're delighted to partner with the Indian Music Industry or the IMI for this round table. Uh, the IMI has been one of the key driving factors for greater credibility, transparency and efficiency within the larger music <coughs> royalties and collection ecosystem. It has indeed professionalized the space and changed perceptions through more inclusive and insightful discussions, such as the one we hope to have today. IMI members include major record companies, some of whom are represented here today, uh, among several other prominent national and regional labels. Uh, its broad objectives, and I've taken this from the website, so I know I'm pretty accurate, are to preserve and develop the rights of the recorded in music industry through anti-piracy efforts, promote and encourage the development of musical culture, and to facilitate the evolution of fair trade and business practices. For this roundtable, Eshia is proud to have one of its own, Dr. Megha Patnaik, commencing the discussions by providing the Indian economic context in radio broadcasting and music licensing. Apart from being a fellow at Eshia, Dr. Patnaik is an assistant professor at the Indian Statistical Institute, where she's been teaching since completing her doctoral studies at Stanford. A warm welcome must be extended to Dr. Mark Schultz, who is the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company Endowed Chair in Intellectual Property Law and Director, Intellectual Property and Technology Law Program at the University of Akron School of Law. We're keen to hear Dr. Schultz providing an international perspective of the radio broadcasting and music market, which is something we in India can learn from so as to adapt and adopt best practices. This is something that aligns very closely with Eshia's mandate, which is to build institutional capacities <coughs> for generating ideas that enjoy the triad of people, innovation, and value, consequently helping reimagine the public policy discourse in India. Following Dr. Schultz's intervention, Ms. Shoini Sengupta, who is also a fellow at Eshia Center, will moderate the round table, which will include some initial comments from experts, after which we'll have Dr. Mr. Blaise Fernandez, president of the IMI, uh, to offer some closing remarks. And with that, I would like you all, uh, thank you all for taking the time to be here once again and request Dr. Patnaik to share with us her presentation on legacy challenges in radio markets, where she will also highlight global <coughs> benchmarks in terms of how collection management bodies work. Uh, just a small request to the speakers and even when you're speaking for the round table, uh, to speak closely to the mic. We're trying to record this. Uh, this is a topic that not everyone is engaged with, but we want to reach a broader set of stakeholders later on. So thank you so much. OK, thank you, Amjad, and uh, for hosting the event. And thank you, Mr. Fernandez, for an IMI for conceiving of it. I'm as close to the mic as possible, I hope. Um, so today, um, I'm going to talk about something which uh, is um, essentially uh, not a very unique idea, which is how regulation in India is falling behind technology. Uh, but I'm going to speak about it specifically from the perspective of uh, the music industry and the radio industry. Um, so essentially, the particular example that uh, uh, you know I'm talking about today is the Copyright Board's order. Uh, where um, essentially radio uh, radio stations uh, who were trying to acquire music from uh, music producers and content uh, owners essentially uh, through you know various uh, legal history ended up with the copyright board order giving uh, copyright board order of 2010 which said that uh, radio stations have to pay 2% of net advertising revenue as a compulsory license fee to the uh, content owners um, and the arguments that they gave at that point of time, uh, I'm going to uh, show that uh, today these aren't very valid. And essentially, although this was supposed to be a temporary order, it's been 10 years uh, since the order and is going to come up for review next year. So uh, we want to sort of look at what would be the reasoning uh, for that and uh, you know whether it makes sense to um, change it or not. And of course, the recommendation is that, yes, we should be looking to change it. And today, we have a competitive radio industry where we can move to voluntary rates, uh, providing uh, fair compensation to the owners of uh, music content and also uh, to push towards compensating artists and composers who've um, fallen out um, in this um, license structure. 
So the original copyright board order had uh, a couple of uh, main arguments and the first one of them was access which was that uh, radio is a public the, the public broadcasting system is the way that consumers access music and at that point of time of course there was very limited internet coverage um, listeners did not have uh, essentially fin the financial ability to pay for music at the prices that it was available at then and the radio phases, which currently we are in the phase three of the radio auctions, after the phase three of the radio auctions, that uh, you know the rollout hadn't happened, so there are very few radio channels. And uh, the second main argument they gave, in addition to consumer access, was that the industry was very nascent. So essentially there had just been an auction, and so the radio stations were running in losses. And um, they, you know, sort of did not have the ability to pay for the fair price of music. So that was the argument. And they needed repositories of music to start doing business. At that point of time, there were very few radio stations in operation, and these were running losses. So essentially, the copyright board decided that, you know, they should be given some sort of leeway to be able to start, um, you know, producing, mu uh, start uh, you know, the, for the radio station to start broadcasting music to make it accessible to consumers. Now that 10 years have passed, um, access, I'm going to show you, is no longer a problem, problem, and the industry is no longer nascent either. So in terms of access, today, after the phase three of radio auctions, we have almost 300 private radio stations. All India Radio has 420 radio stations in AM and <coughs> FM. This covers most of India. Um, almost uh, all people have access to the music. In addition to this, people can access music online. Uh, so about uh, 630 million Indians have access to internet. Um, whoever has a smartphone typically uses internet on the smartphone. And penetration, especially in rural India, has gone up in the last three, five years. So essentially, it's not as if access to music is a problem that uh, you know, the radio uh, stations are solving today. So, for example, here I show you where the coverage is of private radio by the end of the third phase of auctions. And uh, most uh, tier two, tier three cities are also covered uh, by the time the third phase has been completed. In terms of growth, the industry is not nascent either. So if you look at the uh, you know, rates of growth of, the, uh, of, of uh, radio companies um, and the parent companies that own them, then essentially this growth has been exponential. So in other countries, radio is sort of a resilient industry that it's growing but at a slow rate, but in India it's expanding rapidly. Uh, and relative to the music industry, it's doing uh, much, much better as you can see. Now, uh, so essentially today when access is no longer a problem and the nascency of radio is not a problem, uh, the the order which essentially said that because radio industries made uh, radio companies made losses in the auction, we should uh, give them a subsidy for music at the cost of the music industry doesn't make any sense, right? Because the underlying uh, you know value is coming from the music itself. So if there wasn't any music, then there wouldn't be anything for the radio stations to you know, get the ad revenues off of. And even they realize this because out of every one hour of music, uh, one hour of content, at least 50 minutes is music. After that, you, know, you start losing listeners. Uh, in addition to this, now the radio industry has expanded into uh, having a YouTube channel, having live award functions. Um, there, were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of money coming in from political ads in the last year. And as we can imagine technology evolving, so as we move, for example, from analog to digital transmission, you can carry five channels on a single frequency. So once you have something like that, the content is going to matter a lot, and especially having quality content, having variety of content, having diverse content. So it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense from a long-term perspective to be subsidizing the radio industry at the cost of the music industry. So if you want to do a subsidy, you could just do a direct subsidy, but doing it at the cost of the underlying uh, you know, value producer doesn't make uh, much sense in the long run. So um, essentially what this boils down to for reviewing the upcoming order uh, next September is that earlier we did uh, in other sectors also provide subsidies wherever we thought that there were nascent industries and they needed to be protected to some extent. But once those industries matured, we didn't continue having a subsidy for them. Um, so 
uh, from an economic perspective, it makes sense that today we have voluntary licensing uh, in this uh, engagement to get a fair market rate to the content holders and the owners. And any specific subsidies that the government wants for certain types of content or certain areas uh, for them to have access, these can be transferred directly. And what this would do is essentially in the, wrong, in the long run, it, it's going to uh, encourage having quality and diverse content and more investment in the music sector. Um, eventually, hopefully, this also reaches artists and composers who uh, have been losing out, uh, especially when you have uh, sort of mainstream, large, uh, um, you know, uh, music producer, uh, large, uh, you know, uh, sort of mainstream music coming from the radio. And ultimately, benefiting the music industry in this way uh, is also going to um, benefit the radio industry in the longer run. Um, so that's essentially um, the economic arguments from here. So thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions or in the round table, I think we can do that. Thank you for bringing me here. And first, I, I apologize. My host was confused as to which conference center I was going to. So I, was, I'm, I kept you all waiting, and I'm very embarrassed for that. Uh, and I'm appreciative of this chance to be here and to address you. So I recently uh, have done some work on the on the market for performance rights and sound recordings globally and so I was asked to provide some global context and so that's what I'll do here so we were interested to discover how comprehensive legal regulation of the licensing of music for broadcasting affected the music business so this is really a topic that's under examined globally um, and so uh, let me, and so what I'll do here, what we discovered is that compulsory licensing is pervasive. Uh, the nature of the, the bargain tends to suppress rates, and uh, that appears to have some, some difficult, you know, some pose some challenges on the industry, particularly in an era where revenue streams are changing, where industry uh, opportunities are changing, and so we have policy recommendations that uh, v very much resemble Dr. Uh, Pat Pat Patnik. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm terrible at that. Um, okay, so what we what we found, and of course this slide is is not terribly helpful, but what we found is that, uh, in fact, I'm going to skip it. What we found is that globally there are a few different regimes for licensing music for broadcast but uh, typically what you have is either rates are, are there's no compensation at all uh, which is only really a few rogue countries uh, North Korea and the like um, or uh, that you have the rights you have only the right to compensation or you, the third regime is you have nominal rights, where in theory you have the right to negotiate, but in practice your rights are often set by a court or an administrative board. Um, and so the, in this regime, uh, licensing rates are uniform, uh, typically. The rights are administered by collective management organizations, and for purposes of our discussion, putting India in global context, this is very much a legacy of history, uh, one that India doesn't necessarily need to burden itself with. Why do we have this regime? Because uh, starting in the 19th century, uh, or even the 18th century in some instances, uh, copyright owners organized themselves into collective management organizations. Why? because it was very difficult for them to do transactions, right? I mean, we're talking about an era without telephones uh, for starting in the 19th century where it was difficult to travel, difficult to monitor, difficult to determine rights. Uh, even moving into the 20th century, discussing an era that's more relevant for, for radio broadcast, um, think about 20th century radio broadcasting. If a DJ were going to sit there and play music, um, the DJ 
would uh, and, and had to know whether the rights were licensed to a particular record they were going to play because that's what they would have been playing in the 20th century. They would have had to leaf through probably a big book or something, right? And new music comes out every day. This is impossible, isn't it? The, the, nobody would do this. Um, you wouldn't have it an existing market. So the rights owners came together and they, they organized a, a collective management organization. Now the reaction to that, though, is often, uh, there were often competition concerns. So the reaction to a collective management organization is that many governments said, well, you can have a collective management organization, it needs to be regulated, and they imposed these terms. They imposed uniform rates, uh, non-exclusive licenses, and, and so on that we see today. And, and why do we still have this regime in so many countries? Well, um, really, one, it's, it's a, a matter of what we call path dependence. Once you start down a particular path, certain people, because certain parts of the industry become invested in it. It's very advantageous to them to continue on this path, and it's very difficult to change. But we live in an era where things have changed quite a bit, haven't we? Have, don't we? You know, we, we imagine a DJ today, that same DJ today, they're not spinning records. Uh, and if there were certain music, there was certain music that was allowed in the repertoire and certain music that wasn't, it's quite easy to separate that electronically. It's quite easy to track payments and plays and to do transactions so that everybody gets fair compensation using digital technology. We have the technology today. Um, we don't have the same transaction costs we had 200 years ago, 100 years ago, or even 30 years ago. And so it's possible to have a different licensing regime. And the difficulty with the one we have that's particularly, uh, I, I guess, particularly unfair and particularly bad for consumers of music and the music industry is that the regime that exists globally, the regime of compulsory licensing, um, tends to suppress rates systematically. Let me explain why. Um, but first, before I do that, uh, I'm remembering, uh, I need to also pause to note that compulsory licensing is really an extraordinary solution. Um, and I think this supports the the uh, concern that, you know, having a statutorily imposed license, statutorily deci either decided by a court or decided by an administrative board, is really a strange solution. Think of all the transactions you do in a day. You know, you go to buy food, um, you, you buy various necessities of life. Most of those prices are not set. Some of them are regulated, but um, most of those prices are not set. And it's really kind of extraordinary to think that something as um, both well-loved, but really not necessary as music. Music's not dangerous. Deprivation of music isn't going to end anyone's life. Um, and there's always music you can find. Uh, that is the thing that governments so heavily regulate and set prices for. It's a strange set of a state of affairs that we typically don't do, and why don't we do it? First of all, it's inefficient. A board, a court, can never have enough information to set the price right. It's simply impossible. We don't know what prices people um, are willing to pay. A court doesn't know that. Um, a court doesn't know uh, can't uh, really understand the cost structure, and it can only look at the information in front of it at the moment. You know, in the regular marketplace, you know, this changes day to day. You know, somebody who you buy food from might raise the price if his prices go up, um, might lower the price if there's more competition. You might choose to, to shift your consumption to a different product. Uh, it's, that's the efficiency of a real market where we push the decisions down to the buyers and the sellers and let them make the decisions day to day, that is the most efficient way for people to decide what's best for them, how they want to order their affairs. And this knowledge problem is just really impossible to overcome for courts. And then finally, there are non-economic values that compulsory licensing violates. You know, we care about personal autonomy, independence, um, artistic independence in the case of creative goods, and these are all, th these are all values that these kind of systems 
uh, don't allow us to exercise. And sometimes we make exceptions, don't we? You know, sometimes it's important for, gov for government to impose um, restrictions on the market because other values uh, are more important. But, but typically, I don't think we'd say that entertainment, access to entertainment is one of those values, or, or preferring radio broadcasters over musicians and record labels is an important policy value. It may have been when you had an infant industry, but if the industry is not an infant industry anymore, there's really no reason to shift revenue from one party to another except pure political rent seeking. Okay, so uh, one other point I think it's important to note about the way things work currently is when you have a court or a copyright board, or in this case, I guess right now under the statute, it's currently the appellate board since 2017. Um, when you have them set rates, inevitably, when the rates are set this way, you tend to suppress rates. And this is really just, um, this is, this is a, a, a situation that when you think it out, you know, I, I have a fancy diagram using game theory here, but... Uh, really going backwards, I'd say that what we're doing here is bargaining. You, we can put aside all the fancy law and economics and say what, when we bargain in the shadow of compulsory licensing, who has the upper hand? The person who has to pay the rate. Um, the person who already has the right to, mu to use the music, <clears throat> they, have <clears throat> they have the upper hand because when the music industry comes to them and says, we would like to raise our rates. What's the response? Well, we don't want to pay more. And what happens if they don't pay more? Well, there's a compulsory license. So they continue to use the music, right? And so then the party seeking a rate increase has to go to the court or the board or the appellate board and ask for a rate increase. Now, what can the party who would have to pay the increased rate do, they can delay. And typically what they can do is delay and delay and delay, and that whole time they're not paying the increased rate. And what's the worst that happens to them? That ultimately they might have to pay the increased rate later. So if you are the person paying the rate, it's always in your best interest to say no initially to a rate increase. You will always refuse. I'd say for a public held com publicly held company that owes a duty to its shareholders, I'd say it's almost their, it's their duty to not bargain. It's their duty to force the other party to try to go to the tr to go through an adversarial proceeding to try to get the rate increased because there's no there's they there's no reason for them under the law to pay the higher rate initially when requested. What this tends to do is systematically suppress rates. What we found when we looked at rates globally is that uh, they are on average 1.8 percent of rev total revenue and I want to to emphasize that point. They're globally on average they're 1.8 percent of total revenue ranging from a low of less than 1 percent to uh, almost over 8% in Denmark. Uh, now, I do want to emphasize that's total revenue, not net advertising revenue. And that there's a big difference there, particularly when it comes to accounting. It, it's, it's always infamous that if you're, if you're getting a royalty off of net, uh, the net, then the other party finds a way to inflate its expenses to lower the rate they pay you. Um, and another point to be made, and why it, does this seem unfair? I mean, so it's a low number. So what uh, is something you may ask fairly. Uh, it appears to be a very low number intuitively and also some academic literature supports this being an exceedingly low number uh, because when you think of what music is to a radio station, it is an essential input. So say you have a seller that sells one product, they have to buy it from somebody else and sell it to other people. It could be produce, you know, it could be vegetables, it could be an Apple computer, um, but if, they are, if that is what they sell and they are a reseller of the product, 
what do you expect them to pay the original seller? One or two percent of their revenue? Those would be wonderful project product uh, profit margins for any industry. And by law, it appears the radio in, the radio industry has essentially achieved this kind of profit margin off of its essential input. Um, when 80 percent, I heard you say about 50 minutes out of every hour. When eight, about 80 percent of your airtime is devoted to music. Um, that is what you are providing to people. Um, it's a and and yet you're only paying one to two percent of two percent of revenue. Um, that is an extremely low price. Uh, some economists have looked at what might be fair prices. It's it's really impossible to determine what a market price would be because we have no market here. But if we but arguably there are some comparables. So some economists have used various kinds of bargaining methodologies to determine rates would at least be 25 to 50 percent if the parties had to bargain in a voluntary market. Um, uh, one, one particular, one economist looked at radio in Canada and he said, you know, uh, the other choice that radio stations have is is to have a talk radio format. What kind of royalties do they pay for talk radio? Well, when they, they're buying talk radio, they, they, the rates average around 28% of their revenue in a free market. So if you're paying for talk, talk radio, that's your alternative, right? You could have a talk radio format, and you're willing to pay and able to pay 28% of your revenue, but you're paying less than 10% of your revenue to have a music format. That seems like there's something, uh, something you know, happening there. You know, what's the difference? The talk radio market is a market where parties freely bargain. The music market is not. There's not free to bargain. If we look at streaming services and iTunes in the United States, they're paying 55 percent of revenue or 70 percent of revenue. Now, granted, these are different types of uh, consumers have different types of experiences on streaming services and iTunes because they can choose what they play. So, of course the music is even higher value on those services and indeed needs to be compensated more highly. But I think this gives you a sense, though, uh, that other purveyors of music are giving a very large share of their, need to provide a very large share of their revenue to obtain the essential input of their service. Uh, and yet, you know, under law, the radio industry, I guess, is excused from this necessity. Um, there's now one could fairly ask who cares? Uh, you know, who cares whether the music industry or the radio industry gets more money? But as you pointed out, there are effects on investment in music. There's no, there are suppressed rates, there are no exclusive deals, so there's no creativity in business models. And it tends, but most importantly, there's less money to invest in new artist development and also developing new business models, potentially, uh, like we see in other areas of entertainment, where, for example, say Netflix or another video streaming service or a broadcast service like HBO has been uh, invests in developing its own new content that's very popular. Um, that's really impossible for the music industry to do because they have to do these non-exclusive deals and accept low rates from everybody. So yes, we still get music, uh, but we don't get the kind of creative artist development we might get otherwise. And so that's what these systematically low rates do. Thank you. Uh, oh, so I have, I have, I have recommendations. I'm sorry, I'm a bit jet lagged. Uh, I I have recommendations, but you know what? They're they're very much uh, the same as my colleagues. So I think I'll just skip to the end and let the discussion start. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, so much. I think uh, both Mark and Megha deserve a round of applause for a wonderful presentation. 
Um, so I'm Shohini. I'm a fellow at the Esha Center. I'm looking into legal research here. And the primary focus at Esha is also looking at some of these contemporary issues of uh, both the digital world and innovation. Uh, so we often work at the intersection of intellectual property and are looking specifically at future trends and how um, the creative industries are going to add to the innovation sector in India. And we're looking at future trends on these issues. So this is particularly important for us. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, so the panel particularly will carry the discussion forward from Megha and Mark's presentation who have very helpfully set the context for us. Um, so the format of this panel will be that I'll just go around making some quick interventions, ask uh, all of you a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll open the forum and would appreciate if everyone sitting in the room can uh, sort of make uh, interjections with insights of their own. And um, yeah, so the panel particularly will look into the legislative history of compulsory licensing in India, and uh, hopefully we can inculcate some sort of international best practice on monetizations, on regulatory setups, etc. We are also going to delve a little bit into questions of uh, quote unquote public access, harms, whether compulsory licensing differs from statutory licensing, uh, etc. So on my extreme left is Nidhi uh, Javar. He, she's a legal associate at IMI. Uh, then we have uh, Trishi from Koan Advisory, she's an associate there uh, and focuses on IP and competition with a particular focus on emerging technologies. Um, then I have Sank uh, Sankar Dalal, head legal from Z Music, uh, who's hopefully going to provide us with some industry insights. Um, and of course, we have Mark and Megha to join us. Uh, so Trishi, if I can start with you to provide us with a little bit of legislative background. Uh, and I'm hoping that you can set us the context of how the compulsory licensing sort of framework developed over the 2012 copyright amendments, whether it made sense then, what are the legislative reasons that this happened in India, and uh, followed up with uh, some insights on the 2016 uh, constitutional challenge to that, and whether it made sense then, and whether it makes sense now. Okay. Um, thank you, Shohidi. Um, so just to answer your question, I think I'll go back to like, what um, the basic premise of copyright is. Um, reason being that I just want to take it back to what um, the conceptual underpinning is and how that translates into compulsory slash statutory licensing in India. Um, so just primarily, what does copyright do? One is that you have, uh, you're ensuring incentives for creators and how, and, um, the pri and the reason why you do that is that you, uh, you want them to add to the knowledge pool of society. Um, and how do you do that? So one is that you provide an exclusive right to, you, to publish slash um, cop allow the copying of that right. And um, of course, uh, that is limited by your copyright term, after which it has to f finally come back into the public domain. Um, and then the second thing is that you allow for fair use exceptions, where for specific uh, purposes, which are primarily non-commercial, uh, you allow the the, the uh, limited use of that of that uh, copyrighted work. Um, in the music industry, um, what I would say is that if you look at copyright license, uh, if you look at compulsory and statutory licensing, uh, you'll find that one of the reasons why it was uh, one of the reasons why it, it is um, integrated into the copyright system is that you want to also somewhere provide access to the pub, to that creation and through that access you're also enabling discovery of the music right um, that uh, back in say 2010 and even 2008 when like some of this st conversation started um, was that you know your copyright uh, so your uh, music musical works are not really discoverable outside of say like your radio and uh, you know your tv broadcasters uh, for instance like i grew up and i would like discover music on like mtv uh, or like vh1 okay or the radio um, if i wanted to buy new music otherwise i'd have to go and buy a cd etc which of course they i mean and of course those uh, uh, you know, those sort of uh, avenues were a lot more, let's say, cost prohibitive for somebody 
uh, that's interesting listening to a lot of music. Um, so you know, like where you have a copy, so where your radio and TV guys are then therefore incentivizing that discovery. Um, well, so it somewhere ties back into that, um, into the basis for copyright, which is that you want to be able to create, uh, in, you want to be able to ensure the uh, creation of more works and uh, through providing certain incentives. And where you do that, it's uh, if I'm allowing discovery of those artists, then I can allow more and more, say, uh, you know, ticket sales or uh, CD sales or whatever. Um, but I mean, of course, as uh, you know, Mega and Professor Schultz have already spoken about, um, those sort of paradigms have changed. Uh, of course, in 2012, when this amendment was brought in for statutory licensing, uh, what you would get, what was sought to be remedied is two things. One is that you want to be providing public access uh, through easy, through the removal of impediments to uh, licensing of works for radio broadcasting and, of course, television broadcasting. Um, but uh, other than that, you had the other consideration of providing a level playing field where you want, where uh, you know your record or your copyright owners or copyright licensors uh, are presumed to hold a certain monopolistic power. And uh, you know uh, the radio industry at the time was a fledgling industry, so you want to be able to provide them an, an equal bargaining power um, when they're trying to negotiate for these. Uh, of course, in 2000. Then you already had compulsory licensing, which is meant to solve these problems at a uh, you know on an individual basis. Uh, what 2012 does is that it um, sort of goes further than that, and it makes it an automatic license, so that if you are a if you are a broadcaster, you simply apply to the copyright board. Um, now it's the IPAB, and um, claim uh, not claim, but uh, somewhere just a request a right to license that. Uh, license the work, and um, so what this finally did, and like I was just refer I was just referring to um, the scoping that has been done by Professor Schultz, uh, where they talk where they've looked at the different regimes that exist. So I think India would be somewhere between remuneration only to nominal ex exclusive rights, uh, where you know there is a provision where you can actually, uh, up, you know, you where you know the uh, the copyright owner is given the right to. Uh, to participate in the royalty setting process, at least procedurally and by design. Uh, of course, um, there are other considerations like uh, the functioning of the copyright board, whether those rates have, already, have even been decided. So ultimately what has happened is that 2010 uh, rate has become the standard. And um, so the prices have been frozen at 2% since 2010. Uh, so essentially what that means is that there's, I mean, though there is a there is a provision, there are those safeguards that are uh, provided for in the Act and the rules for uh, providing, let's say, uh, scope for mimicking market negotiations and providing the scope for the copyright owner to, to uh, be heard uh, in the process. Uh, that's not really been followed, so ultimately it's, it ends up becoming a remuneration only slash uh, ex normal and exclusive right sort of a framework. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Trishi, for that. I'm just going to pull in... Uh, um, Mark here. Uh, I was interested a little bit uh, into a slightly legal philosophy of copyright that she very uh, usefully brought into the context. One, of course, is the angle of public access, uh, which I think Rishi sort of mentioned that the idea of public access has changed considerably in the past couple of years. Another reason for compulsory licensing, and particularly in India, is also to prevent the abuse of monopolistic power. Uh, I just want to get back to you on this, whether you think to prevent monopolistic power only, if, co if compulsory licensing works as an antitrust tool, or should that be left outside of this regime, and that you use this only for the public access argument? And in that sense, does the compulsory licensing regime for copyright render itself uh, sort of useless in this context? All right. So... A compulsory licensing regime, in, in some respects, tr as I think you're you're getting at, solves a, a problem that hasn't happened yet, um, and uh, that may and that may not need to be solved. Uh, so yes, you you have you certainly have competition policy, you have competition authorities, and there is an opportunity to regulate negative practices, uh, bad you know unfair practices, and in fact. Uh, I think 
uh, any any licensor knows that one of the the tactics their licensees will 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 employ is that if the licensor gets too demanding, too plays too hard, um, they they know that in the background there's always that potential for a complaint to competition authorities. So that is 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 one very valid point that competition law always exists. There's always resort to it and you have a licensee who's very interested in using it to protect themselves. A second point is uh, industry structures are often such that the uh, that the radio industry uh, has its own ability to protect itself in negotiations. In In many countries it's just as much of a consolidated player, uh, if not more so sometimes, than the copyright owners. And so, uh, you know, I think, I, I don't know the exact market structure here, but I saw that at least some of the, there are radio networks, right, that own many stations now. Mm -hmm. They they have their own bargaining power, and so in that case you have you have two very strong parties sitting down at the table together, um, and indeed what happens in, in in some countries too is the rights the users of uh, various sorts uh, of performance rights band together in industry associations to negotiate. So in that case you often really only have two parties at the table uh, who are bargaining on very you know equal footing, and they don't really need the intervention. Of the court so I think it, this is a good time to sort of ask Nidhi about um, and since we're hearing from both parties about both about the changing dynamics of the law about when compulsory licensing came in again and whether that needs to change now and also from uh, Trishi we heard about the changing dynamics of the industry itself uh, I think it'll be useful if you can provide us with some sense because you're sort of looking at the market as a whole about how to how do you think the growth of the industry is going to happen where we can ensure um, both that that the changing consumption patterns are taken into account both in law and in practice and also the regulatory patterns sort of need to change to prevent uh, sort of monopolistic tendencies and also promote growth of the industry so from that industry perspective which uh, can you help us give some context about where do you think this is going in india Right. So, um, first, we should consider why uh, compulsory licensing and statutory licensing came into being at that time, as pro pointed out by Megha, Professor Schulz, and Trishi, that the radio industry was a fledgling industry back then, and it was at its nascent stage. So, in order to provide it the much-needed support, the government decided to uh, provide uh, rates. So, the compulsory licensing order uh, came about. Uh, and the radio industry needed that at that point. Uh, and in 2012, the statutory licensing provisions were introduced in law. But at that time, the radio industry, as I pointed out, was at a nascent stage. Now, if we consider the figures, according to the IFPI audience net survey of 2019, 53% uh, users, uh, surveyed respondents, used more radio than they used the last year. 86% of surveyed respondents used radio to access music. Now, uh, as Megha correctly pointed out, 83% uh, of radio airtime is comprised of music as well as talk time. Now, we also see that a 3100 crore uh, radio industry pays only 60 crores to the recorded music industry. So this clearly indicates a growth in uh, the radio industry. Now, as uh, the radio industry does, uh, industry's revenues are not just limited to advertising revenues. They are limited to new forms of revenues, as Mekha pointed out. Uh, they have a lot of political revenues that are coming in. The uh, radio industry is now engaging in more of um, content production and syndication. And they have an online present, uh, presence as well now. So clearly, uh, this can be seen as a form of overprotection over protectionism by the government because they are subsidizing one industry at the cost of the recorded music industry and i it's not fair like this is not fair value because radio rides on the backbone of the music uh, of music of course i mean m music is the <coughs> essential component of radio so in this sense uh, now uh, the compulsory licensing order is coming up for review again in september 2020 so, uh, of course, uh, a voluntary licensing re regime has to be taken into place because, as you pointed out, that a 
level playing field had to be uh, done for the radio industry as well as the music industry. Uh, however, now they are at a level, play, level playing field. So there's no reason for statutory licensing or compulsory licensing to exist. There's one fact that the compulsory licensing order is the order that is continuing till date. The statutory licensing provision has not been relied on till date. So uh, I believe, we believe that um, the compulsory licensing order uh, when it comes up for consideration, all the factors are taken into consideration. So the prices, when they are considered, they shouldn't be considered at the initial rates at which, uh, at the initial 2% net advertising revenue rate as set, it should be considered taking into account all the developments. So uh, A, we believe that uh, a statutory licensing provision should be done away with. Uh, a voluntary licensing um, regime should be in place where market forces, ma uh, everyone is at a level playing field to negotiate. Secondly, in case uh, it's pointed out that a procedure is already into place, uh, for compulsory licensing to exist. I mean, that is uh, assuming but not admitting that, you know, compulsory licensing still exists. Then uh, proper pr procedure. So till date, the IPAB has not had a copyright uh, member per se to determine rates. So this is one reason, this is a very major reason to look into the qualifications of the technical members of IPAB. So uh, right now, we just don't need legal experts in copyright. You also need to take into account the economic considerations as well. So uh, what are the market rates? What, are, what, are, what is the growth that has happened in the industry? These are all the factors that need to be taken into consideration. So the copyright tribunals in the US, in the UK, their qualifications include economic as well as legal uh, background in order to determine rates. So uh, this is one system which we believe should be in place. So yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very useful context you've painted because I think we see that with a lot of tribunalization and regulatory bodies in India, we don't necessarily capture the essence of the, the market skills required to, to render the job. Um, I just quickly want to bring in Sankalp here and correct me if I'm wrong, I read that Z Music bought UAE's oldest radio station, uh, Hum or something, right? That's called Hum. So I was just wondering. Uh, that's not Z Music. That's not Z Music? Not Z -music. Okay, there was a Mint article. I'll, pre I'll, I'll uh, refer back to that. Uh, generally, as I was talking to you just before the panel, I wanted to get your comments on the maturity of the radio market in India. And uh, since you're invested in the market, where do you see that? And when this, IP, when the, the rate setting comes up for review again in a year's about 11 months time, what are these economic considerations that the regulatory bodies should consider <coughs> and particularly dependent on the growth of the radio industry? And I'm assuming here that if you paint the picture that the radio industry is growing, is thriving and is in a competitive space, then it allows for more free market regulations. Uh, so maybe your perspective on that. Sure. <coughs> so uh, Megha had uh, shown the graph. Mm. Uh, the growth of the radio industry and the growth of the music industry. Mm -hmm. If we go back to the year 2001-2002 when the private FM radio industry was still actually infants. Mm -hmm. Now at that point it was still a farce there because there was public access to the content. Mm -hmm. All the AIR stations around the country had access to the content. Um, these FM radio stations would have only provided access in a few cities, in a few markets. So there was no public access motive, there was no public interest motive at all. It was basically subsidizing these guys. Now we reached the year 2010, hopefully the infants would have grown up, apparently they didn't. Um, we get this ridiculous 2% order which did not even take into account whether, uh, that it was only supposed to be against PPL. It were, did not take into account whether what payment has to be made for the underlying works did not take into uh, account the changed circumstances in the radio industry. Mm. Uh, almost all the players who were there in 2001, 2002 survived and thrived and were there in 2010 and additional players joined in. Um, now we are in the year 2019. Um, we have 31D. The infant has grown up to be a spoiled child who is refusing to leave his mother's basement. They actually have a provision under 31D. Uh, let's say Let's say the IPAB fixes a decent rate which is uh, acceptable to the music industry, mm -hmm. which does not work for the radio industry. They still have an additional remedy under 311B, 
they can again go there apart from of course negotiating so i don't know where this is going to end mm. um the music the radio industry is about three times the size of the music industry uh how long do we need to subsidize them uh, when is the government actually going to come and subsidize us uh when we acquire music um and we earn no money on it we go we run into losses the government doesn't subsidize us the the producers don't subsidize us no one subsidizes us so why are we supposed to subsidize this one industry which is already three times our size i think that's a useful uh, segue now for mega because you specifically spoke about uh, specific subsidies if at all uh, given to the relevant market if at all uh, i want to ask you the question particularly because sankal brought it up and whether you think that is the right way to go forward or whether we should just get rid of these uh, any sort of interventionist policy from the government more particularly i wanted you to sort of comment on the small uh, content producers um and looking at the content industry in india to sort of bring in more regional content to sort of break the the homogenous content that we see on radio um and this is going back into india's tradition of having a lot of regional content we have so much content and we keep talking about this in the larger creative space as well uh that we're not finding enough avenues to tap into that um so maybe you can talk a little about both the cultural and the economic uh, potential that's there in india uh, as well as sort of taking on from sankalp's uh, idea of subsidies okay thank you shohini that's actually a very interesting uh, topic for me is the intersection of technology economics and then uh, legal also comes in Uh, so the example i want to give you is uh, of netflix so some of you may or may not know this story but netflix when it was a video rental company uh, it came up with its personalized recommendations and the reason this happened was that earlier there would be you know the top 10 movies to watch and they would be physically sending out you know video tapes and then they realized that if they do this you're going to end up running out of video tapes for certain movies and the other ones are going to just be sitting realized so they essentially develop personalized recommendations so that you know they could um, optimize their inventory basically uh, if you think of uh, you know that that as a technology that's the kind you know what it induced is personalized recommendations if we think of radio on the other hand you don't have this constraint so in radio because you're uh, you know sort of broadcasting and uh, you're reaching the Uh, median listener what you want to do is uh, you know play music that most people will tend to like so you end up playing music which is very very popular so if you switch from radio, radio station to radio station you often find just the same songs right uh, often exactly the same song not even within two three songs um and uh, what what it does um is that it really does push out the people uh, who are producing uh, unique kinds of music that people may wish to listen to but they don't have access to on the radio today right and uh, if we think of policy so that would be the economics and the technology of it and now if we if we think of bringing in you know regulation and policy around this then today the problem as we've all sort of agreed is not one of access so it's not that you don't get to listen to music i mean you always had all india radio now you also have all these private radio stations but they're all playing the same thing so what you don't have access to is different kinds of content and that is you know something where um in some sense because of the technology there's a gap uh, in the market and there would be a reason potentially for a regulator to step in for radio right because what would you know what what could you do to sort of promote uh, uh you know so essentially uh you know when you think of regulation coming in you want it to be where you know you can't solve things through market uh forces and dynamics and also uh in terms of you know objectives your objective should no longer be access it should now be developing diverse content or you know the quality of music and uh, you know thinking of other technologies which are competing with radio that uh, people are listening to so if you really do still care about the radio industry even then you would think about you know growing it not only in one dimension but uh, you know more holistically yeah um so trishi in your initial comments you sort of mentioned the difference between a compulsory licensing and a statutory licensing so uh, i wanted to sort of tease that idea out a little bit here um also i mean 
if you can sort of make the differentiation or perhaps raise the question about fair use, and if at all, why is this not covered under fair use, and why do we need a compulsory sort of slash statutory licensing regime at all in the law itself? Uh, so perhaps you can start with the difference between a compulsory licensing and statutory licensing. I think that will be a useful context to set for the non-lawyers here at least. Um, okay, so with respect to the difference between compulsory and statutory licensing, there's, uh, one is your procedural uh, difference, and in substance, it also applies. Uh, in substance, it's about what it covers. Uh, within compulsory license, it covers all copyrighted works, and um, it's pr it uh, applies primarily to the <coughs> right to republish certain content or content that has been held back from the public. Uh, how that how it procedurally pans out is that there's um, a requirement that you do actually go and approach the the uh, copyright owner, and then if let's say that your negotiations have failed, you approach the re relevant statutory authority, and they will um, they are supposed to check whether indeed the negotiations were you know, let's say in in bad faith, uh, and whether that will result in harm if it is withheld from public, and uh, they'll determine the royalty rate uh, upon, like you know, negotiate upon um, you know providing hearings uh, opportunities to the copyright owners, and um, you know uh, they'll determine whether the copyright license should be given out. Uh, within statutory license, it covers primarily your broadcasters. So television and radio is what is covered, and what it and the primary reason why it was brought out was that um, there were I mean. So if I would just refer back to the standing committee report that sort of uh, evaluated this, when in 2010 this bill was proposed, uh, was that uh, there are negotiations that have not uh, panned out as they should be. Uh, there are actual impediments to accessing that content. And third, that um, there's been the, you know, the adjudication has failed in the sense that there's deferring sort of um, they're differing opinions and uh, rates that are being set by different bodies. Um, and so what was done was that you provide an automatic license, uh, which is your statutory license. And procedurally, what that means is you don't actually need to go to the copyright owner. You directly approach the IPAB, and they will, uh, upon determination of a relevant royalty rate, will uh, hand out the license to you. Um, so that covers your primary distinction, I suppose. And um, with respect to whether it's not, why it's not covered within fair use, um, I'm actually not like, uh, it's very comfortable answering that because I feel like that's a very complex determination in any case. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I would think that it could possibly not be considered fair use is that it's being used for commercial purposes. Uh, I'm not using it, let's say, for my own private enjoyment. I'm using it for something that's more, more uh, commercial and public in nature. Um, but of course, those are questions that I think somebody who has uh, been dealing with those questions a lot more, uh, you know, let's say, concertedly could be better placed to answer. Yeah. Sankar, you had comments. Uh, yeah, just uh, to give you an incident from what happened immediately after the 2% order mm -hmm. was passed. So in respect of works withheld from the public or on re unreasonable terms, immediately thereafter, um, the label I was working with, existing licensees who had mm -hmm. license agreements, voluntary agreed licenses, suddenly all sent letters saying, now we're going to pay you 2% expecting us to say no. Those, that would be our unreasonable refusal approach the copyright board for a compulsory life. It's become a farce at that point of time. Actually, while I have you on the mic, can you give us a little bit of insight into the bargaining power that I think Mark spoke a lot about? Um, and how do we correct that? I mean, one way, of course, is to sort of upend this, this licensing regime. But there are, are there other sort of ways that we can do this, considering, say, in, in, in the case of India, you don't know where the regulatory sort of setup is going to go. Say we continue with this, what are the other ways in which we can sort of correct the bargaining power here? I mean, you have to leave it. Sure, yeah. we'll get back to you. I mean, you have to leave it to the market. There is no market failure here. Mm -hmm. uh, radio stations are not uh, going bust uh, around every corner. They are thriving. They've become larger than the industry. Um, there are other, the streaming platforms, they are thriving. Mm -hmm. They, apart from a few who are trying to include... Uh, internet within 31D, everyone is on voluntary licenses right. and paying much higher than what a radio station would relatively pay right. voluntarily. Right. So I think we have to leave it to the market. Okay. So 
first of all, I agree that uh, there is no market failure and it is best left to the market. But second, if you, we have to find a second best solution, there are, there are some precedents from, from other countries. Um, so one of the things you would do is uh, set a standard of evidence that, uh, that, the, that the, the royalty board should set, uh, set rates based on a willing buyer, willing seller um, standard. With res and look for reference market transactions that inform its decision, right? So this is the standard of decision, not just simple fair and equitable remuneration, but but try to um, try to direct the the board to make some determination based on on facts that are out there. We don't really have a lot of market tr reference transactions, but there are some reference transactions we can use. Second. Um, I, I very much agree with uh, Needy's comment that uh, that the members of any board that determines this should have economic expertise. I was I was at a conference with one of the U.S. Uh, royalty judges and in July, and uh, he he heard my paper that I, I talked about here, um, and he's you know was quite sophisticated with respect to economics, and we had a long discussion about the economics of the industry and economic models. So that is the sort of person that sort of expertise you would want to include on your board. Um, third. I think an, another thing you can do is uh, set periodic review of rates so that it's not up to the industry to initiate a rate review, but you know have opportunities to seek to seek uh, increases periodically. Um, another thing that the U.S. has done for and some other countries have done is to set a deadline on the determination. Um, that way, it doesn't languish forever. Uh, and finally, depending on how the mechanism is set up, um, you can impose some pen potential penalties on the licensee for delaying the process unfairly uh, because, as I said, rates typically are not, uh, they're not retrospective, so the, the licensee always has a, an incentive to delay. So take away that incentive to delay. Either penalize them for delay or, or, vi or just simply uh, cause them, to force, require them to pay the increased rate retroactively if they lose. Right. Um, I think unlike most roundtable discussions, we have concrete recommendations that we can take away from here. Uh, I would like to open the floor, and it'll be great. Yeah, we can go one by one, just a couple of uh, house rules. If you, have, you can make comments, you can make questions, just keep it brief so that we can cover maximum ground. And if you have any particular questions to panelists, you can address them. And it'll be great if you can sort of introduce yourself to the panel as well. Yeah. Um, okay, ma'am, just after that. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I remember the 2010 proceedings quite clearly. I was a part of it. And uh, I can tell you that some really nice econometric evidence was led uh, from both sides. Uh, really speaking, that board was a part-time board. Uh, there was, uh, and this is something we need to take in from a historical perspective for the future. Um, the phase three uh, auctions were on the anvil, and the entire industry had publicly stated that they would not uh, bid for uh, the phase three auction if, if, if the performance royalty fee question wasn't sorted out. So it was clearly, in my view, a political decision at that point of time. Um, in fact, uh, your, your presentation, uh, when, it, when it looked at the basis for the decision, uh, my recollection of the board's order is exactly one line of, of what the basis for the decision was, that it's in infancy and it, uh, you know, it needs help. That's all that, that the basis was in a rather large decision which dutifully kind of reproduced what uh, all the arguments were. But having said that, when you're looking at the future, I think from the music industry's perspective, and uh, I consider myself a bit of an outlier here, but uh, I think it's the same old arguments being dressed up again in the, in the same old way. We are actually nowhere 
uh, you know, we, there are no new arguments, and the new arguments are there in front of us. Those new arguments are, why is it that the Indian music industry is only looked at as the recorded music industry? Where is the publishing industry? Uh, and where is the articulation of the publishing industry? Worldwide, it's a $9 billion industry. Um, if you're talking about new stakeholders and new payments to new stakeholders, are those payments from the recorded music as piece or are they from the publishing piece? And when you look at the music industry, this is a dynamic industry which has many facets to it. That's the creative facet and then the business facet and the recorded music industry uh, which invests in the creation of music benefits either through separate entities like inter the international music majors are sensible to do or under one roof like Indian music labels uh, are, 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 are uh, you know, have traditionally structured themselves. But this inability to kind of bring out before uh, uh, rate setting courts the fact that copyright in itself is a bundle of rights, uh, these need to be paid for separately uh, has definitely, in my personal view, impacted not only the valuation of the Indian music industry. I mean, it's it's ridiculous that uh, Ghana.com, for instance, gets a $100 million investment and is valued as a unicorn or $900 million or whatever, and the entire valuation of the music industry is $175 million. Uh, it's, it's, it, 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 in that example itself is an indication of uh, what needs to change. And what needs to change is is the presentation of the copyright facet, uh, uh, the fact that policymakers need to understand that the right stream requires for different payments. Now, in the US, there is a political uh, uh, or policy inter intervention which does not allow for the payment of sound recording royalties over, over terrestrial uh, uh, broadcast, right? There's no political intervention in India for not requiring uh, the payment of publishing royalties. Uh, and, uh, you know, the longer the music industry takes to sort out uh, or, or to present this uh, face of the, of the copyright sector in the correct way, uh, it's the music industry that's going to take the brunt. The danger is that in the future, if there's no split, visible split between the publishing stream and the recorded music stream, the music industry, the recorded music industry is going to have to pay for the creator share of royalties, and that's the inevitable result. So I think it's time that when you present this, I think we need to develop, you know, uh, better arguments. We've, be, we've been there. We've talked about subsidy. We've talked about exposure and substitution. We've talked about the the, the death of the physical format, the rise uh, of, of of digital streaming, etc. We've looked at studies from the U.S. Uh, with that the National Association of Broadcasters came out with, which were peddled in, in India as well. We had counter studies. So all of that has been done. I think we need to kind of present the copyright sector in its, all its vibrancy as it is internationally in India and make policymakers understand that this is not a unitary right that you're looking at. It's, it's, it's a complex, multi-layered right where there are multiple payments or two payments and there are stakeholders that need to be satisfied. Otherwise, the music sector is not going to be of uh, much benefit to, uh, you know, in terms of contribution to the exchequer or employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Ma'am, you had a comment here. Yeah. Um, just one thing, uh, you mentioned that the average is 1.8% globally. But if I was to look at content costs, I, I analyze the business of media for a living. If I look at content costs in TV, in streaming, others, it's anywhere from 25 to 40%, from newspapers to streaming to television. So just as a benchmark for your research. My, I had two questions. One is, do we have any studies or any data on uh, markets? What has happened to markets which have shifted from compulsory to voluntary? Uh, voluntary. Has that impacted the business hugely? Are there any studies there? And then I had a second question. <coughs> Should I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. The second question is how much difference does market structure make to uh, whether or not voluntary versus compulsive, uh, compulsory licensing works? So for example, India is a messy, fragmented market. And that was one of the reasons the radio industry could get away with doing a 2% thing. It remains a 
a messy market. I mean, you could use a T-Series as an example of a large music company, but there, is, there are no large music companies in this country. There no, is nobody with lobbying power or fighting power. And IMI, I think, has come alive in the last couple of years, I think, since Blaze has come. But I've not seen any live lobbying from IMI in ages. And I've been covering the sector for 19 years. So, you know, in a messy, fragmented market, what are the options when you talk compulsory? Right. Who would want to take that? I've got the first one. Okay, Megha, maybe the second. No? I, I, I okay. understand the second as well. So to your first question, have there been any studies done uh, regarding the economic impact of moving from a, 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 a statutory slash compulsory market to a... Uh, to a voluntary market. No, because it hasn't happened. So you can't do a real life study. It's interesting though, the National Association of Broadcasters in the United States, uh, which does not have to pay royalties uh, for sound recording. Uh, it does have to pay royalties for publishing. Uh, but they did a study, they sponsored a study. And it was an economically sound study and, and the, the fellow did the study and, and, and it was his his theoretical result was that if the industry, if the radio industry had to pay a 10% royalty, um, you, which would be higher than any other industrialized country, but if the radio industry had to pay a 10% royalty uh, going from 0 to 10 for sound recordings, you would lose uh, a few percentage uh, points. You would lose, you'd lose some you would lose some radio stations, a few percentage points. Um, and the National Association of Broadcasters touted this as a C, we'll lose radio stations if we have to pay royalties. And I, I, was, I, was thought, I found it sort of strange to be so proud of this study that said if you, if you take a business that's paying nothing and now, that now they have to pay something, some of them will, a few of them will go out of business. Well, of course, there's always marginal operators who, if you increase their costs a little, um, they'll go out of business. So, I, you know, I, I would have thought that they would have almost buried that study. I, you know, I thought, that, I'm sure they were hoping for like a, a disaster. You know, we'll lose 20% of our radio stations, 50%. And it's instead, if you, they had to pay a royalty, they would have lost a small handful of stations. I, I can't hear you. Sorry, are there no markets in the world with voluntary? I mean, how do they compare with markets with then? If there are no studies, how do they compare? There, with there really, there really are very few. Uh, but what we're seeing emerging is there are voluntary markets for for digital delivery and for streaming, and, and so and there we're seeing much higher rates. But we're seeing that the industry still exists. And perhaps just a very quick point on access is. Um, you know, one, one thing that strikes me when we worry about, if we're going to worry about access, we need to remember that uh, the music industry does, does, not, does not want to withhold its works. It doesn't want to sit on a pile of music and, and laugh at the world that can't hear it. It has every interest in, in, dis, in giving access. It just wants to give ac you know, provide access in, an, in a way that is, is fair and, and, you know, where they reach a fair business deal. So we'll still have access. We'll just do it through the, the market because they have a product they want to sell. The second point, the concern about fragmented, a very fragmented market and efficiency, wouldn't it be more efficient to have one, you know, a simple imposed license? I think, sure, it's always simpler. I mean, and that's what regulation tends to do. It brutally simplifies complicated things. I, I tend to notice that when, when you have the government step in in a vibrant, messy market. Um, for people to actually regulate a vibrant, messy market, you have to tidy it up and take away people's choices and options and opportunities and make it simple in order to regulate it. And yes, it would be messy, but this relates to my, the point I just made. Everybody in that market has every reason to want to make it work. And so if you give them the opportunity to do so, it may take them a little while to get to that point, but they'll get there. They'll form organizations, they'll form collectives, they'll make deals. And maybe what we might see is a different market where you have
uh, some regional, you know, regional language content that says we're underrepresented. So we're going to form an association and sell the music for less. We're going to undersell the big guys, and that's how we're going to get access to the market and actually get played on the radio we haven't seen before. And yes, that's much messier than today's market, but it gives consumers more choices and it creates more business opportunities and it sustains more career and di careers and diversity. Thank you, Mark. So in the interest of time, we'll just take two quick questions, and if we could just be brief, and we'll club them, and then, uh, yeah. Hi, I just don't have questions. I have few comments. So the subject is actually close to my heart, not because I'm an intellectual property lawyer and run a law firm, but because I've very recently I was working with policy and I worked with uh, Blaze very closely on this issue. And I actually went to the government. So I was working as a UK intellectual property attache in India. And I went to the uh, government, met the, jo uh, met the joint secretary and uh, European Union delegation, me and few other embassies. We spoke to the uh, government about this issue and the impact on the music industry and how you know radio industry is thriving on music industry now we try to you know argue with them on the uh, economic argument and uh, uh, you know as it has been established through various uh, uh, you know presentations here that economic argument was the argument which actually you know uh, uh, gave rise to compulsory licensing regime in india now the problem is the government says okay we can't really interfere in you know uh, economic arguments here economic impact we are nobody to take care of economic impact and our argument was when you know it it was coming into the uh, coming into being you were taking the same argument now you're not taking the same argument so that doesn't make sense number 1 number 2 the pr problem is not with respect to radio TV industry alone the problem is also that the compulsory licensing regime is also being you know uh, um, extended to internet broadcasting now so as we know like I think most of us know about the two 2016 order and there were actual court orders saying that uh, you know uh, the statute was only limited to radio and in, uh, radio and television and you can't really extend it to radio uh, sorry <laughs> internet now the problem is a new uh, proposal post law which says that you you know it, uh, the uh, the compulsory licensing will have to be extended to internet broadcasting as well so i absolutely agree with his comment that policy makers need to understand the problem and the economic impact and that's uh, how it should go and you know okay. try to resolve the problem right Thank well you. taken ma'am um, one last yes, comment maybe yes. okay maybe two quick comments first ma'am and we'll wrap it up okay very quickly yeah ma'am uh, I just want to add that uh, I represent a label and a publisher, so um, I wouldn't say that uh, without the artist, uh, you know, the record label, I would rather say without the artist, the label is nothing, and without the label, the artist is nothing. So equal, both sides are equal. Uh, so before the 2012 amendment, there was a statement that I dreaded to hear, which was that once the sound recording is played, the underlying works are subsumed in it. It, be it began in 1977, and I was hoping that by 2012, 12 after the amendments this sentence is not heard but even today when we are negotiating agreements we find it very difficult to convince the other side that there are two distinct set of rights and the label is it the record label is different and the publishing or the underlying works are different i think this is where um, you know greater awareness has to be brought into picture as amit was saying that record label should not be responsible for the uh, um, artist royalties and vice versa well taken, ma'am. And one last comment. Today is really Amit's day. There have been many days when people agree with lawyers, you know, and other lawyers agreeing with him even better. <coughs> so I would, I just wanted to compress my comment to one line in a way, actually. It's all about the money, honey. Right? We are all talking about, and everything I've been hearing from the beginning is about who is going to get the larger piece of the pie. So here, the three uh, categories that Mega mentioned, economic, uh, tech, and legal, I think you have to really add the fourth dimension and probably the most important dimension or probably the only dimension which is going to work, the big P. And the big P here is not the big picture. As you rightly said, it's the political thing. And I'm adding another angle to all the political aspects that have been brought up here. Where is the dialogue? in all these discussions on how is it going to benefit the bureaucrat or the political uh, uh, narrative. 
we are not talking about the money per se to them or something. I'm not going into those aspects. I'm talking about how is it going to benefit them. For instance, one example I can come up immediately is if it is made voluntary, is that going to result in higher cost for the consumer? If that is going to be the case and if the political scenario is going to look at it as that's going to impact the ultimate voter. Today we are talking about young voters and it's the youngster who has his entertainment in his hands. We are old timers who still go to all those old traditional uh, methods of listening to music, right? So if it is going to impact the youth, then I'm not going to touch the regime as it is. So are we really addressing it from that side? This is just one example. There are um, several others. So for instance, I was just thinking about when somebody was talking about X is getting X million, Y is getting Y million. As a government, if I'm looking at it, and if I believe that I'm getting my taxes, whether it's from X or Y, it doesn't make a difference to me. What is it that you're selling to me as an idea which will allow me to change? I do not see a sales pitch at all over here. I think that's the, that's the aspect that you need to really address. What is going to appeal to a government, to a bureaucrat, in terms of what are the political or socioeconomic, which has political uh, leanings, uh, you know, benefits to them that they will want to intervene. Because the problem with laws are that once they have come in, very difficult to check them out. Hotel California. There. Thank you, ma'am. I think that's a useful way to end the conversation. So we can have continue this discussion. We have a high tea, and we will love to carry this forward. Uh, maybe with a cup of tea. So we are running quickly out of time. Maybe just in a line or so. Yeah, uh, I appreciate uh, all the stuff. First of all, I'm new to this. Uh, my name is K.K. Minolcha. I'm new to this field. First of all, but I, I may be giving a kind of innocent remark. If if you perceive so. I like the ma'am's idea that uh, how the bureaucrats or uh, uh, the government would perceive that I get money from X industry, Y industry. To bring in a, one more perspective to it is the supply chain perspective. If I fragment, then it sounds good, the arguments sound good if I get from this, uh, I'm, as long as I'm getting. But the, if you see this from supply chain, the, the industry won't rise. Some part will die, some will. So if you want a harmony of the, like I compare it often with the power sector supply chain. One piece in the supply chain, the fuel, the lack of fuel, coal, or uh, et cetera, or the distribution uh, industry, one piece affects the other. So as a result, the whole sector grows down. So when everything is win-win for everybody, so when all stakeholders are in win-win equilibrium, then probably the including your politicians or bureaucrats. Uh, that's what I wanted to bring in perspective of supply chain right. alignment. Right. I think that's a great way to put it because I was also thinking of incentives and unless we have all stakeholders on board and unless we sort of map those incentives onto a larger policy, uh, we're going to keep having these discourses. And the way policy will develop is through litigation, which uh, unfortunately for anyone apart from a lawyer is not a good scenario. Um, so I would like to invite Mr. Blaise Fernandez, uh, President of IMI, to give the concluding remarks, and then we can proceed for tea and more discussions. Thank you, Essia. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik, and all the participants today for putting this together. You know, despite our deep diversity, pluralistic society, and you know, traditions and culture, the recorded music industry in India still languishes at 15th on the global stage. China was behind us till very recently. <clears throat> what China did was they moved the entire system to voluntary licensing. And today, China has leapfrogged the top 10 markets in the world. And probably in the next three years will be the top five markets in the world. But I think the big takeaway, and I think I'm happy for Dr. Napinai for setting this up. The big takeaway from the China story is it wasn't a silver bullet, there were silver pellets, and they've added 40 million jobs in the music ecosystem. So today, for a bureaucrat or a policy maker where unemployment is the big question in India, I think there is a uh, for okay, there's a there's a story in China to look at. Let's get down to India. 
the digital phase has going to kind of see, you know, local genres re-emerge. These genres never were there because there was no demand and supply. Each, for example, Malwa has its own genre. The, uh, you know, there are regions in Tamil Nadu have their own genre. They were never there. And these genres can only be handled by the medium and small scale sector in India. So if you want to kind of talk of MSME India, these are the guys who know the local genres, they know what works, what doesn't work. Digital industry, you know, the, the big boys can never handle this. The international players can never handle this. And I think that is something that will kind of reopen cultural preservation, getting new employment, getting new genres, re reopen if this moves to a voluntary licensing system. The third thing that I'd like to kind of, uh, the, the second case study I'd like to bring to the table is K-pop. Today, the K-pop industry is valued at $5 billion. The biggest K-pop player is BTS is valued at $1 billion. The IPO is going to come out next year. The government of Korea never interfered, like the government of India never interfered in India software sector, and K-pop emerged. Okay? IPOP is not happening because there are no investments happening in India in the IPOP sector. Everybody's playing safe at the end of the day in a very regulated market. Everybody wants to kind of hedge their bets. For IPOP to happen, you need international investments coming in. And so you talk of FDI, you talk of all this, but of the 25 international labels that actually operate in across the globe, just five have presence in India, two have major presence, one has half a presence, and the two others are just flitting in. So you don't have international, so you get IPOP like K-pop to happen, you've got to get FDI, and FDI is not happening because of a regulatory system which is antiquated. Lastly, you talk of soft power, so you talk of K-pop. You talk of exports, you talk of make in India. The LATAM, LATAM industry, which is, you know, the Latin music that comes out from Latin America makes more money outside Latin America than in India uh, than, than in Latin America. And f about 500 million is the exports revenue for the Latin American, you know, Latin American music industry that comes from parts of the world. So if you want to have the next Despacito from India, I think it has to kind of, you know, ensure that there is enough of free play, there's enough of voluntary licensing happening. I'll end by saying that, you know, to a large extent, the indie music industry, the record music industry touches all the touch points that Prime Minister Modi envisages and wants to develop. We are Digital India, we are MSME India, we are Make in India, and we are Export India, we are FDI India. And I think if the government is very serious of generating employment, I think this is an example. China set 40 million jobs in the music ecosystem. Low-hanging fruits, all it needs is tweaks in its policy. And we do hope that they will listen and there will come a time in very soon where voluntary licensing is the operating principle in the record music industry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Talk to doc Dr. Schultz and Dr. Batnaik for your presence here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> I'd like to request you all to join us at the Terrace Pergola for Haiti, where we hope to continue the conversations.